Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, right? Well, welcome to the session, the Internet and Shops Preparing Shen Y and Set for the Future of Work. What a title, right? But, well, my name is Agustina Calegari, and I work for the Internet Society, and I will be moderating this session today together with Bruna Santos from the Youth Observatory, who is sitting uh, in the other side of the table. Um, I, I would like to start by telling you why are we here today and what we are discussing this morning. Well, as you know, access to the internet, digital platforms and other technologies are changing the nature of work as we know it today. Uh, however, the impact that current technological trends will have on the labor force is not that obvious. So a range of the scenarios are possible, and in all of them, youth play a key role. So um, as the Internet Society Future of, uh, sorry, Future of the Internet Report, not of jobs, uh, shows the evolution of the Internet and technology generates anxieties and fears about its impact on the future. Um, in this context, in a context where employment plays a central role in society and economic development. Um, in addition, we don't have to forget that still more or half of the population of the world has not access at internet at, for the Internet at all. So um, uh, in recent years, it has been postulated that technology will cause shop losses up to 50 percent on all shops over the next few decades, but at the same time, it's an opportunity, and many studies are, are showing that uh, the movement of the economic activity to the Internet is beginning to uh, have a positive impact on employment too. And we see here an opportunity for, for you. We see that the topic has been incorporated also in the sustainable development agenda adopted by the United Nations in 2015, in which decent work and economic growth and quality education are established as specific goals to achieve by 2030. Uh, in this context, with many possible paths, we have the tools to make the change, and that's the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we see that also international forums such as G20 and G7 have put this issue at the center of the discussion, and we believe this is a relevant topic to discuss here at the Internet Governance Forum today. Uh, in this concept today at this session, we are bringing together uh, an amazing panel representing different stakeholders and youth from different regions to discuss how the Internet is impacting on, on the future of work and what policies are needed to ensure young people benefit from technological changes. We will have this morning with us Claudio Lucerna from the University of Paraiba, Brazil, Maria Preto from International Labour Organization, Lars Stefan from ECHO, and Fatou, Ms. Fatou Cantu, if I'm not saying wrong, if, if not you will correct me later, uh, representing the Ministry of ICT of Senegal, Pablo Hinojosa of, from APNIC, um, and we will also have youth from different uh, youth organizations like the Youth Observatory, Digital Grassroots, and um, the Youth iShare program, where and I'm seeing many, many phrases from the program here today at this session. So I, I would like to thank you all for coming this, this morning. Uh, we have planned a, four, a round table, but we found out that we have a panel now. But I, I would like to encourage you to make comments, questions, and share your ideas as regards this topic when we open the floor for, for comments and questions. Uh, the panel will be divided in two segments, um, uh, one about the general scenario on youth and employment, and another focus on digital skills. Um, to begin with, we will have uh, Claudio Lucerna, who is a professor at the University of Paraiba and a researcher at the Foundation Science and Technology of Portugal. So we will start with him. He, he will give a pitch uh, about the future of shops uh, and the Internet. So, Claudio, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Agustina. Thank you all for coming. 
let me start this by saying that I'm also speaking here in my capacity as an honorary youth, okay. <laughs> which I take to understand uh, that I have been there enough to be acknowledged, but I'm not there, I'm no longer there enough to have like kind of an active membership in the youth uh, group. But uh, still, uh, we had, the, I think was, this was the first time that the IGF in the opening ceremony had a head of state deliver such a strong speech. I think this is, this is something unique in the, story, in the history of, of IGF. We do like to say that we live in very special times where, where these amazing things happen. I think this is a kind of a way of mankind of dealing with this, its insignificance over time. But that being said, I do like to think that because of the, in, over the internet, about the digital times we live. Because of three dimensions, changes has, have never happened in such a wide scale. It means they touch all areas of human activities. Changes have never hit so deep. It's not that everything changes, it's that everything changes a lot. And changes have never happened that fast. It's not that everything changes, that everything changes a lot and very fast. So in, in this scenario, it's, it's fair to say, I think it's fair to say, even recognizing that we usually have that line of living in important times because we, we do not acknowledge our finitude, but I do think we, we have, we're living in, in, in very important times. Uh, for this theme specifically, I've been, I've been uh, for the past year and a half, we have been discussing this theme in fora all around the world. When I deliver this as a longer presentation, the, the pitch argument usually comes from a line that said that praising the effects of automation and calling the attention for the dangers that automation would bring. Just this line is from then Senator John Kennedy, 1960. It's going to be 60 years. So it's not exactly a new concern. But I do think the latest developments that we have in technology have speed up that process. Now, with the, with the latest trends, of, it looks like the more semantic activities, so to speak, were a little bit safer from the automation and from the scenario of, of uh, job, job shortage or change that you were about to face in the future. But now, with the new technologies, with the new trends from the past, say, 10 to 5 years, this process has accelerated a lot. Uh, the changes are coming. It is true that these changes usually cause a shift in, 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 in the, the nature and the kind of job that is to be exercised. exercised. I'm going to give you an example. Association for Privacy Professionals for dealing with, with the new scenario of a data protection officer. For those of you who are not familiar with the reform of the, of the data protection systems in Europe, but also all over the world, this profession alone, this function alone, is uh, estimated by the AIPP to need 80,000 new positions in the coming years. It's 80,000 positions of a job that did not exist some time ago. This job did not exist. This is probably what's going to happen to my son, who is two years now. And this freaks me out a little bit, because how am I going to, to, to drive him and to orient and to guide him to develop a profession that might not exist as I know it, right? So this is the challenge that you have ahead. And uh, knowing that challenge and having seen that this theme has a space of discussion in every forum that we have been over the past year and a half, I'm glad to announce for now an initiative. I was, co I was coming here and ready to announce a date for this event. Unfortunately, unfortunately due to latest political developments in Brazil, we, ha we are not sure that we're going to have the amount of support and resources for that. But the idea was to take this theme out of a session, discussion in the main events, which is already a very important space, and to promote, from the perspective of a labor court in Brazil, a whole forum o on the future of work. Because here's the thing, and, 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 and I think this is very important for this room, and I'll leave it here. We have been discussing this for a year and a half. And up until the time that Agustina called us to discuss this together during an ICANN meeting in Panama, Puerto Rico, in, in, in Panama, I noticed that we were discussing the future of jobs with people like me, who 
roughly have a future and are not very much interested in the job then. <laughs> this is not right. So we have to incorporate this. I'm not saying uh, uh, people who have been younger for longer do not have to be in the table for the discussion. We can, I think that there are things we can do, but at this, the perspective of the youth is absolutely essential in this discussion. So uh, with that, I've seen, I'll leave it back to you. I'm coming, I'll, I'll I have to apologize to you because I'm leaving to another session where we are going to discuss a couple of technologies that will uh, contribute in that job shortage in the future. But I think your participation here, and, I, and I'm very glad to see the, the presence of, of so many young people here to debate this theme. Let's take it to another level and let's, make the, let's take it to have the importance that it has in the coming years. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Claudio. Uh, if you have questions or comments for Claudio, I'm sure you will find him at the cocktail tonight. <laughs> but, um, well, as Claudio mentioned, we had an event in Panama to discuss uh, from a youth perspective the, this topic. Um, after that event, we decided to, to make a proposal and bring it to ICF2 uh, to have a conversation with youth and uh, stakeholders working uh, on these topics here today. So um, now we we'll, we'll are going to begin with the first segment of, of this panel, which is about youth and employment. And I have Maria Prieto here sitting behind me. She is a specialist in the International Labor Organization Future of Work Initiative. Maria provides technical support to the Global Commission on the Future of Work and um, to the work of the ILO on the subject. So I would like to start by asking her about what is the purpose of, and the aim of ILO Future of Work Initiative and how youth, including youth employment, is being addressed within this initiative. Good morning. Uh, so yes, I'm Maria, and uh, also I also wear a youth hat, although it's not so visible, <laughs> unfortunately. It's, uh, but I have worked for a very long time on youth employment issues in the ILO, and now lately on the future of work. So what I wanted to, um, to highlight, uh, Luana and Paul, whose name was, I had already started to give you the, the scene of how the world of work is changing. And in the light of what has been mentioned, uh, the International Labour Office, that is the, the UN agency that, uh, if you like, regulates work, uh, both at international and national level, uh, launched an initiative a few years ago that is called the Future of Work Initiative. Just to look at these issues like how is work changing? How is work changing uh, in different parts of the world for different age groups, um, for different sectors, for different industries? Uh, what are the skills required? So a number of issues uh, are addressed. And for this, um, like a high level panel was created uh, of specialists. Uh, but in that uh, panel or of specialists, there is also youth representation. So there is the youth envoy that I'm sure you know, uh, that is the envoy to the Secretary General. And she has provided the voice of youth in this discussion that has been extremely helpful uh, to, uh, to take into consideration. Um, what will happen now uh, for the initiative is that in a couple of months, uh, there will be recommendations coming out from this panel on how to address the future of work in a regulatory basis, like how to govern the future of work. This is something that is extremely difficult to, to know. As it was mentioned earlier, uh, we don't know exactly how we will work in the future. We can speculate, we can talk about different ways that things will change but we don't know. So there is a, a high level of flexibility that needs to be included in governance. And as you know, this is not an easy task. Uh, 
So that is, for example, one of the issues that are addressed. So in January, the recommendations will be launched that will have implications for our organization, but also for all the countries that are members, the 187 countries around the world. And also for, obviously, the, the populations of those countries. Um, so I just, should we just move on to the next question so yeah. I don't take too much time? Well, I have another question for you, and um, is how are the internet and new technology trends changing the way we work, and what are the implications for use? Um, what are the dry, what are the other drivers of change that are influencing the future of work, and how do they influence use in particular? Okay, so. I don't know if you've read in the newspapers, you know, X amount of jobs will disappear, one article. Then you have another article saying uh, so many millions of work will be created uh, due to the technological ch uh, changes. So there are many speculations, some are positive, some are negative, but what we have seen is that more than the jobs disappearing and being creating, created, the way we work, like the tasks we have as workers are changing and have been changing for the past years. And it has implications in, in our productivity, on our health, uh, on the family with relations, etc. And these are the issues that are important to tackle, and particularly for, for youth that are entering the labor market. Because in previous times when things were less hectic uh, in technology, because as we were talking earlier, it is the speed of change that is overwhelming at the moment. Uh, so it's difficult to, to tackle the speed of change by the uh, policy makers. Um, so previously we had programs for youth integration in developed countries, we had other programs in other parts of the world, all, you know, to steer young people into the labor market, to formalize the informal, etc. <coughs> Whereas now things are moving really quickly and the internet of things are also influencing a lot. Although in many countries, like in the Nordic countries, for example, there was a, uh, a study on how big the platform economy is. And one would have thought it was really big because uh, everybody was talking about it. It was a lot of things in the news, but it's only 1.5% of the whole uh, working uh, economy. It's sort of still a limited amount. But the issue is the trend, that it is growing so much. Uh, so though that has implications on how people enter into the labor market. And that is the implication for youth and youth employment. How will the programs look like to channel people into the labor market? Not only youth, but for example, women that take a break in um, childcare, et cetera. And talking about that, uh, there are sectors that are growing also that are not related to technology. That needs to be said as well. And notably, one is the care economy. Uh, child care, a care of elderly people, uh, the care of the, and also to some extent, care of the environment and care of the community. Uh, so that is one sector where youth is often very active in. So, so there are many, as you were uh, mentioning, many drivers of change. There is not only technology. The drivers of change that we are looking at in the Commission also include demogra demographic changes. Uh, in many countries, uh, notably in developed economies, there is an aging population. So that, that brings particular problems for funding uh, social protection, for example, whereas other parts of the world have an increasing youth bulk. And then you have an increased mobility of people on top of that. So that influences, obviously, the way 
people enter, how they enter into the labor market. Another uh, driver of change is climate change, obviously, that you hear often, and how that influences the way we work is also extremely influential if you think about it, because we organize differently today uh, than we did a few years ago. Globalization is another one, another driver. We're talking about now something called globalization 4.0, not only industrialization 4.0. Um, there are also geopolitical shifts that are influencing, uh, as well as cultural development. The inclusion of more increasing, in some, some areas, uh, women in the labor market it has also a cultural implication that has developed over the years. So what I wanted to, to highlight with this is that technology and internet is extremely important, but it has to be seen in the context, in the wider context of all the changes that are happening at the moment, that, uh, or the quick changes that are happening. So, and also all this has to be taken into consideration where you are in your country, how developed or non-developed it is. We did, to finalize the comments, we did a, a survey in, or we had dialogues in 110 countries where we asked uh, the countries to give feedback on where they thought they were on the future of work. Youth was also participating in this. And one of the issues that we saw was that developing countries were talking about how to increase happiness, whereas developed economies were saying that we can't deal with it because we are on survival mode. So this is another issue in this, in this world that we have that we need to take into consideration. Thank you very much, Maria. We will have her for the second segment too. So now we will continue with Choi Watagi Ndungu, it's not, I'm not saying wrong. Choi is the vice president of Digital Grassroots and he's the lead coordinator of, for the East Africa Youth Internet Governance Forum. Um, so I would like to ask her about how she see, how do you see the situation in Africa as regard youth employment and how do you think that access to the internet can help to um, to improve the situation or to tackle the challenge you see? Thank you, Agustina. Um, well, oh, sorry. Thank you, Agustina. Um, well, for now in Africa, you know, uh, we are a bit skeptical because we are like, this thing, internet, why is it taking so many jobs? So we are thinking, uh, why do we need it? But we know it is creating a lot of jobs. Um, but uh, how we see the future of work in Africa? Uh, I work for a very, the problem right now, you know, is a cultural difference. Uh, starting from, you know, as close as, you know, my father, he, he is always asking me, oh no, you mean this person has sold land online? How can I do that? Why are they doing that? That is so weird. So they think it's very strange. So, you know, first of all, in Africa, the problem, you know, is the cultural thing. They don't understand this thing, internet. Why is it, you know, doing this? So um, how I see the future of work um, in Africa is that, you know, we do already have it. We are creating very many opportunities, I uh, would say, like in digital grassroots. We create uh, a lot of opportunities. If you've visited our booth, you will see that we have a digital rights monopoly board, which is, uh, you know, pretty interesting. And, you know, we, it was uh, hand-painted by someone we've never met, and it was sent to us, you know, here in, um, uh, for the, you know, IGF. We've never met this person. We don't know how this person looks like, but, you know, we created an opportunity for them. So, uh, and we've created a lot of opportunities for people, you know, in sub-Saharan Africa, um, in the future, uh, I mean, in, in, in the field. But we need not to talk about this field. So, um, in our countries, we always want to say, you know, we want to be the best place to work. So, we want to talk about... Um, is this the best place to work? So like she said, yeah, we are very focused, you know, on increasing happiness. So we want, we always say, um, is this the best place to work? 
Uh, how do we make it the best place to work? Um, I am affiliated with another organization called Paradigm Initiative, and they're really struggling to make, you know, um, their organization be one of the, you know, places that people recommend you to work and every employee is happy because, I mean, we already have too many problems to be thinking about. You know, I am not getting a good enough salary. Why should I even, you know, be... Uh, not be happy but we are also really concerned about the challenges that really come with you know working online uh, there are very uh, there are very many challenges like you know how will pensions work how will the pension system work when you are online how will other things such as uh, days off work because uh, I can say because I 90 percent of my work is online so and I can say Unless I take the day off myself, I don't really have days off. Like, even when I have the day off, I will still get a message on WhatsApp concerning, you know, a certain job. So um, those are some of the things, you know, that will, you know, concern us uh, with the future work and, you know, taking things offline and putting them online because we are like, are we happy or and um, is this a healthy working environment? Have the inter uh, interpersonal relationships been lost, you know, to encourage you to... Uh, you know, continue with the work. So, um, in Africa, I would say, like, um, we, first of all, you know, need to have these conversations and not not have them because uh, we have to also, first of all, cross the cultural aspect of it and get everyone on board. And uh, especially the youth, we need to, you know, converse with the youth. Our youth are so curious and we need to, you know, get them on the table and tell them, oh, yeah, these are the opportunities available to you and this is how you know, you, you, you know, you get on board. And I'm not even talking about only in the policy arena, in the tech policy arena. I'm talking, you know, in other industries as well. We need to uh, conversations, get them to uh, be able to see as much as, you know, you know, there's no way to predict how much you, how many jobs have been lost and how many are gained. But I can say, I can see the jobs that have been gained, as uh, you know, the colleague that left here said. Um, you know, there are different articles that say different things. So we don't really know. But the truth is, um, very many of us here work online and um, it works out. And, you know, sometimes maybe once a year you'll get to meet the people you work with. I have. I just met uh, my colleague this year, you know, so I can understand um, interpersonal relationships uh, are lost. I have never met anyone I work with until, you know, the IGF. i never seen them. But, yeah, I did see them now. And, you know, the interpersonal aspects can be solved in uh, various ways. And for sure, we do need regulation to cater for the challenges such as, you know, what happens about pensions when it's time to, you know, go home and be like, you know, I'm taking a break. Very, we always say we're taking a break from, after you've been in the industry for a minute, you're like, I want to take a break. So we need definitely regulations to uh, cater for some uh, things, especially for, especially, uh, I work for an organization that's in a different country. They definitely have a different pension systems than the, uh, the one that I have in my country. So we need uh, regulations that are harmonized to, you know, say, you know, this is the predictable pension system for this. This is the predict, uh, this is what you do. This is the amount uh, of leave days you get. And um, there are also other things such as, you know, pa uh, countries will have a public holiday in their country or, and you don't have the public holiday and vice versa. So those are the kind, and they expect you to work because it's a normal working day for them. So those are uh, some of the, Issues, I would say we need, you know, to have policy on and regulate in order to, you know, make uh, the future of work the best place of working. Thank you very much, Shoy. Uh, now we will continue with Lars Stefan. Um, Lars is Director International at ECHO, Association of the Internet Industry. Um, they run a number of working groups, including one on new work. <coughs> Sorry. So I, um, I would like to ask you, Lars, which role can ECHO play to work on this challenge? Oh, sorry. <coughs> and what exactly is ECHO doing to address new work? Uh, thank you, Augustine. Yes, <laughs> my name is Lars Steffen. I'm with ECHO, Association of the Inter Industry. 
We are Europe's largest um, inter industry association based in, in, in Germany. So we've got an office in, in Cologne, one in uh, Berlin, and also one in Brussels. So as already mentioned, um, we have a number of working groups like every other uh, trade association uh, is having uh, where we um, bring our members together. And um, of course, we are the voice of the industry that is driving the change that we are currently uh, talking about. But um, one of the main principles um, of uh, ECO as a trade association in this um, field of play is that we always add an ethical dimension uh, to the discussion of digitalization. And um, so the inter industry, from our perspective, um, always has the social responsibility for society about um, what are the implications of digitalization and also of the digitalization of work. So we have a working group that's uh, having the name New Work where we um, discuss um, this process and also uh, discuss um, what are the, the threats and implications. Um, from our perspective, um, um, it's already uh, uh, covered by all the statements that have been uh, so far here on, the, on this panel is um, Yes, um, there's a lot of change going on, which is not new. So economy changes have been there in the history um, of, of work so far. But uh, I also agree that um, the speed is a, a quite different one that we've been seen in the, in the past. But it also um, creates opportunities for new jobs, also for new forms of work. And um, uh, the question is how we shape this future how do we shape this future? So from our perspective, it creates more opportunities than threats to the general labor market. Um, if this is true, um, we will ha have to see in the future. I think nobody here in the room can predict the future at 100%, but we think that there's more opportunities than threats to the labor market. We think that uh, the digitalization of um, of work also offers the opportunity um, to create more valuable and meaningful work because it's not only about creating jobs, it's also about creating jobs um, where you have uh, uh, enough skills that you can uh, bring into the work, that you um, have a social security system, that you um, earn enough money to, to, to have a living you, you can afford. So all those dimensions have to be um, brought into this discussion and this is what we are doing as an association representing the ones who are driving this but also the ones who are driving this are the ones who are being affected because every company um, is facing um, the fact that you have um, people in your company that are asking for more flexibility um, you have uh, the challenge to bring in more women into um, um, the, the IT sector uh, you also have the challenge uh, that you need well, very well skilled um, uh, people, um, especially in, in Western Europe or being based in Germany, we really have a challenge to have a, a well skilled uh, uh, people to uh, be in the IT sector. So we are really looking uh, for people abroad that we uh, try to attract coming to, to Germany or to Europe um, because we can cover uh, the demand on ourselves. So. There are the dimensions of discussing um, how we can um, drive the, the development of digitalization in a, in a positive way for everybody. Yes, um, when you read the, the news and uh, read the papers, yes, the, you always have voices that uh, try to say, um, we have to avoid this and we have to be careful. But when you also learn from the past, um, it's not the way how to handle this and to have a successful uh, way into the future. So the only question is um, how you can participate in this discussion and how we can frame this uh, development in the right direction for everybody. And uh, so this is why we are supporting several initiatives about education so that um, children at school but also <coughs> later on in universities and other educational um, um, programs are getting the right skills to be prepared for this uh, digital future. Not only in Europe, but I think also all over the world we have to establish those standards. But also when it comes to more flexibility um, at work, that um, yes, it might be nice uh, to be uh, able to work from wherever you would like to work from. But uh, this also imp implies the question 
especially for those who like to work from home, that you still separate um, the time that you're spending on your work, but also the time you're spending with your family because um, those dimensions are, are coming closer together and it's uh, a challenge to, to separate those uh, two spheres uh, that you are uh, having at your own home. So um, also from my, from my own experience, when you are able to work from wherever you want, um, you s have to keep in mind um, that there are two dimensions, the work and the private one. And this is something that uh, we also have to learn, that also the, employee, the employers have to learn uh, when they offer those opportunities to their employees, um, that this is something um, we have to be careful about, that we have to work on, and also, as mentioned, um, that we need the standards, rules, and regulations um, that meet those changed um, 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 opportunities and that also frame um, the future of the digital work. Thank you very much, Lars. Perfect timing. Um, you introduced a topic that we are going to, to discuss next, that is uh, digital skills and how we create these skills for youth. But before that, I would like to introduce Sevenik Alivea. Again, I'm not wrong. Uh, Sevenik is a current master's student at the Boga City University in Turkey. Um, she is also part of the youth ICS program. So she agreed to participate here today on this panel. Um, I would like to hear her perspective about the challenge that youth face in, in your region. Um, how do you think that the internet can help youth to develop these digital skills? Thanks, Augustina. Uh, I'm Sevinj. I'm from Azerbaijan. Uh, Azerbaijan hosted the IGF 2012. Uh, some of you may have participated there. Uh, let me first give some statistics about my region. Uh, Azerbaijan is situated in the South Caucasus. Uh, there are Georgia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. So according to the World Bank survey, uh, one out of four young people is unemployed in the South Caucasus region, which is uh, you know, not a good uh, number. So what are the, the question is uh, why people or young people are unemployed. Uh, actually, most of the challenges and reasons behind this unemployment are um, the same with the many main un un unemployment, like lack of qualifications, lack of job creation. Uh, we talked about the improvements in technology and like competitiveness in the labor market. But there are some youth-specific uh, ones, and I want to focus on that ones. Uh, the first one, uh, it's called uh, cyclical unemployment. It's basically companies are hiring young, young people and uh, in times of crisis, uh, the very young, same young people are the ones who are kicked out of first because they do not have uh, much experience. They are uh, vulnerable to be removed from the labor market. Uh, and I think the other biggest challenge is the mismatch in the sub between the supply and demand in the labor market. Because today, um, often it's assumed that when you graduate from a good university with a good degree, you, are, uh, you can easily find a job. But it's not the case in many countries, and it's not the case in my region, too. Uh, companies are looking for people uh, with uh, who are well equipped, who have hard and soft skills, and in this technology driven world who have competence and digital skills. Uh, but often a fresh, poor grad graduate has a like, bunch of theoretical knowledge and uh, a diploma. So um, our education systems uh, focus on the intellectual development of young people, but they do not have enough conformity with the needs of the business world. So we have a gap here. And this gap can only be bridged with a network approach, I think, with the cooperation of all stakeholders from government, from private sector, and from civil society. And I think here we as a young people has, um, we, we have to do something about that. And here is uh, where the internet comes. So uh, nowadays we have an internet where there are a lot of open sources, open libraries. Uh, educational platforms. So uh, we are uh, we can uh, just go to some educational platforms and 
type whatever skills you want to improve and you can attend courses like someone is paying for forty hundred thousand dollar for a communication class in USA and you can attend the very same class for free but uh, there are uh, some challenges to that as well firstly in in our region we have some primary issues like accessibility and affordability uh, but uh, the countries in this region, Armenia, Georgia, and Azerbaijan, is doing a great job on uh, improving the accessibility rates and affordability of the Internet. Each of the country has national strategy. Uh, and uh, I think if we look at the st uh, statistics, they, within the last 10 years, we have seen a great improvement. But um, the other problem is awareness. Uh, basically, most of the young people are not aware of uh, the opportunities out there in the Internet. So, especially people in the countryside areas of the um, countries, um, they think, they look at the Internet like some fancy place to play games and to chat with friends. They're not aware of the opportunities. Um, uh, here, like, we need some initiatives from the government and from the private sector, uh, like, uh, government have to deal with the education uh, system. T uh, throughout history, education system always falls behind uh, with uh, like uh, catching up with the needs of the business world. But uh, government need to come up with some tangible programs for young people in order to prepare them for, for the future of jobs. And private sector here, companies can come up with fellowships and uh, mentoring programs and like trainings for young people. And um, I think as uh, youngsters, we have a lot of things to do as well. Uh, I love to talk about my one of the initiative uh, with m me and my, uh, one of my friends. Uh, we started a project. It's called in English. It's video knowledge. Uh, what we are doing is basically we are creating whiteboard videos. We post them on YouTube, and these videos about the self-learning um, opportunities in the internet. And uh, in the offline part of our project, we go to schools in the countryside areas in the villages, and we try to inform uh, people uh, what that they can do in the internet, how they can prepare themselves for for their future. Uh, if, um, before it's too late. So I think it, these are the simple steps, but these are, uh, I think, very effective. And um, what government and private sector can do, their actions can address the challenge in the long term because this education system or like training programs doesn't um, return on, Im doesn't uh, give return on investment very early, like we, we need a uh, long time. but. Um, as a young people, you can, I don't know, just go to your relative, go someone in the proximate community who, who don't know about the internet, who don't know how to find opportunities, how to improve their skills, and just try to encourage them and inspire them. Uh, it's very basic, simple step, but it's very effective, I think. Uh, so I, I think we, we should all collaborate uh, on, on that, and we should prepare ourselves for, for the future of jobs. Thank you very much, Timmy. Uh, well, we will continue discussing digital skills in the next segment, but we will open now the floor for comments and questions, if you have any. There we have one, two here, three, perfect. We will take the three, and then we will continue with the next segment, because we are, as usual, a little bit behind on time, but uh, please go ahead. Hello. Yeah. I'm from AET. Uh, we realize many websites that give jobs online require first that money be given to, to be registered. How can we know that it is not a risk? Okay. Yeah, can maybe, yeah, we are, I think we didn't understand this, sorry, if you could repeat the question. Sorry. 
there are um, uh, but uh, normally uh, on international recruitment it's that uh, there are certain rules and regulations uh, no? so but why what I don't understand is like if this is a national um, um, online job application why would somebody do that? I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> it makes no sense, really. Hello, uh, I'm Carson from Tanzania. I sort of have uh, some remarks. I would like to thank my sister from East Africa for a great presentation. Uh, I'd like, I disagree with the cultural point of view as we Gen X and Y. This is because I think we, really right now with the trend of globalization we are going to a common culture mostly as young people you know, using the internet uh, all that so we are setting some kind of a common base where we speak a common language when we interact with technology but the issue that comes is that we we have some sort of skills we have people with degrees but we are not employable because we do not have the employability skills Right now, when we talk about the workspace, it's a collection of the people and the machines that are there, because the machines can do a lot of work that you can do. So how do we match that? How do we top up that? Regarding from where I come from, we have people who go to universities or we graduate to universities, and it's the first time you interact with a computer. And the problem is relevancy. Relevancy is a big issue. The technology is available, but it is not relevant to our cases. I'll have an example about mobile money. Mobile money is a technology that is really widespread in East Africa. It's because it is relevant to both generations, the young and the older people. Nobody understands uh, how it works or how a system is, but they know I can go to a spot and uh, withdraw money by just pressing numbers. And that's it, and it has worked. In the diffusion of innovation, it took a really long, it took a really slow time to match up, and now it's a big industry, as well as we can see it has created a lot of uh, employment for young people. So I think still relevancy is the way. How do we make this technology relevant to our current situations in regard to our local, in, to our local structure? Another thing is we have a really big isolation when it comes to the older generation and the younger generation, that they want us to mimic what they do. So if you want to be employed, you have to do as how they do it. When you come with a new perspective, a fresh mindset, maybe you can do it like this, it's a little bit difficult for them to understand. So how do we remove that isolation polarity? And the other thing is we have a really big polarity when it comes to innovation. Innovation from the West side and us. We, we are in an age of quantum computing right now with IoT or whatever, but we see these industries in, are really widespread in the big powers, but what about us? How do we get connected and how can it be relevant to us and utilize these opportunities? Thank you. We will take w one more question. There are many, but we will take one more here. Yeah. Um, then. Okay, thank you. I'm Lily from Ghana and an internet society youth at IGA. Um, the internet is not viewed as just a space anymore, but a tool. I just left uh, a session on bridging the accessibility divide for persons living with disability. Um, I want to know how are the current trends of work going to affect such persons? And does the ILO have regulations or policies set up for disability and work? Thank you. We will take one question more here and then we will have more time for Q&A after the second segment. So please be patient. Uh, I don't know who was next. I think they are right here. Yeah. Yeah, I'm Rajin Pratap Gupta from India, and first let me congratulate you for taking a very important topic. I think uh, the IGF's main thing that we're looking at is definitely jobs and internet. I come from India, so we're not talking of 5 million or 10 million, we're talking of 1.35 billion. And if you look at the World Bank's chief statement in October 2016, he said 69% of jobs in India are under threat due to automation and the number I think for China was 70 plus percent. Now, is internet going to create equal number of jobs that it displaces because of automation? Because we are saying 69 percent. See, I'm, I'm not trying to look at an answer from you at this forum right now, but this is something I think all of us 
not just on the panel. In the room, we got to look at finding solutions because this is a serious challenge. If it was 1 or 2%, 10%, it is fine to manage. 69, 70% of displacement of jobs by internet is a tough challenge and we got to find answers to it. If there are any comments, I would appreciate. Thank you. Thank you very much. Please keep your question for the next uh, round of questions. Don't forget it, please. I see many questions and, and comments. Uh, if there are not any other comments uh, from this side of the of the table? I will give all the speakers here an applause if you go with me. <laughs> and I will pass the floor to Bruna, who will be uh, moderating the second segment. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much to everybody who joined this first segment. And I would like to invite um, the other panelists to join us at the stage. So um, I would like to invite Veronica, Veronica Arroyo. Sorry. Sorry, there were some comments after the questions before. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I thought there were, and that's why I. Moved. Sorry, I was waiting for. <laughs> to get the, um, so you mentioned ILO directly. Yes, there is a program for people with disabilities and how uh, how to address uh, those issues in the ILO. That is quite is growing a lot and taking technology and digitalization into consideration for supporting uh, people with uh, less ability but uh, in in addition to that uh, new technologies also there is an issue of enhancing the capacity of the worker and that can be dangerous also to talk about let like, the enhanced worker it's like uh, a bit science fiction but at the same time, technology can put two persons, one with disability and one w without, at the same level. And this is something that is being worked on. Uh, that's Ghana. Um, then we were just mentioning, I don't know if you were in, in the comment from India about destruction and creation of jobs. And uh, it's everybody's guessing percentages, left, right, and center. And uh, we're never really right uh, because we don't know. Well, we do know that there is a disruption in the economy that we need to address. Uh, and we need to sort of address it through our policy makers, but not only, like in a multi-stakeholder environment. Uh, with workers, employers, civil society, uh, and to involve the private sector in saying how things are changing. Um, and yes, I, I believe the internet uh, is changing uh, the jobs, but it has been changing them for a long time. Uh, for the past, you know this better maybe. Uh, so um, it's any anybody's guess, so everybody have different uh, prognosis. Uh, so preparing, shaping the future of work, that is what everybody's talking about. What is the future of work we want and work backwards from that and not, you know, letting things get behind you, like losing so many percentages, but sort of prepare for the shocks. That is the, my five cents. Thank you, and sorry for, for the misunderstanding. Now, yes, we can, we can continue, right? Um, so, thank you very much, everyone, and then? So, I'd like to thank all the panelists right now and welcome the next one. Yep. Oh, so sorry, yeah, I tend to, I tend to do, I'm a little nervous, so I tend to speak like very little, so sorry about this. My name is Bruna, and I'm also a member of the Youth Observatory. Um, we are one of the special interest groups of ISOC, and we're really glad to be sharing this session with ISOC team. And um, I would like to invite to the stage um, Veronica Arroyo from Access Now, um, and Deye Satu from, it, and Deye is an engineer in computer science, and Sebastian, as well Sebastian, I might not know how to pronounce your name, so if you help me soon. Um, Sebastian studies social work at the Singapore University, and also of that, I'll invite Maria to continue with us on the stage. Thank you very much.
sorry, I forgot to invite you, Pablo, to the stage. Pablo, thank you for joining us as well. <laughs> So, um, following up on our previous discussions, we had this first segment was very, very interesting in which we had short mentions to the importance of adapting the actual frameworks for labor and uh, labor like, around the world. Also, um, we discussed the importance of the ethical dimension of the advances of digitalization and how could um, organizations and companies participate in this innovation and help drive individuals to the digital future. So the second segment is about capacity building policies and best practices. So which is mostly how do we build um, skills within this already born within the digital um, generation. So as we all, may, as some of the um, people, some of the um, person who asked the question right now, we're born inside the internet, we communicate through the internet, we're all inside of this like all the time. But sometimes we, we feel like we miss some of the skills that um, employers, they tend to require. So I'll give the floor to Veronica. As I introduced, Veronica is a policy associate for Latin America at Access Now. And um, the question for you, Vero, is what are the challenges that you young people face gaining these skills and what gaps do they need to, re to overcome to find jobs? Okay, now, okay, yes, perfect. Uh, thank you all for being here, and I, I, feel very, I feel very glad and a little bit of nervous at the same time to be here and represent um, the young people from my region, Latin America. Um, so I'm gonna talk about two points, basically challenges and gaps. Uh, for challenges, what I find was the, like the big challenge that we have is access to education, because what we have in Latin America, and people from my region will not say that I'm lying, that is that we have traditional education. <coughs> so what we need now, one of the challenges, challenges that we have is to go further and try to build the skills and cap do capacity building on um, new type of education that can give us uh, the opportunity to uh, be part of this new, uh, new era of technology. But that comes also with access to technology. So then we have another problem because not all the uh, all the places in Latin America have access to internet, first of all, then we don't have access to all the technology, second of all, and that's another challenge that we have there in Latin America. Another problem is gender issues and cultural issues. Um, I think um, people are used to see um, normal traditional work style. So you go to the office and then you work in something and then you uh, when you finish work, uh, your working hours, then you return to your home, and that's fine. In my case, for example, I work at home, and when I started doing this, my family was very, very worried because they say, "How can you be able to divide your personal life and your work life? This work-life balance, and are you going to be able?" They were so scared. Um, now I've been doing this for like two years, and okay, it's fine. I'm not dying, <laughs> so that's great. Uh, but that's a problem. But we, we need to break that that cultural thing and that how we can, how we see, uh, how we see how work uh, uh, is. And the other thing is gender because uh, we have al already a gender gap there and we need to overcome that. We need to, do, to fix this first um, because access to technology, access to education, yes, we can improve that, but we, if we are not doing anything on the side of um, gender issues and giving more access to women and uh, having, giving them the opportunity to be there also, um, we are doing nothing. So that's from challenges. I think I need to like hurry up. I'm counting down. Yeah? I have two minutes. Okay, I have two minutes to talk about uh, the gaps. So the first gap, and, and, and I think this is, first of all, this is something that we sh I think we all share, all the developing countries share, is that studying is very important for us. I mean, studying is very important for, for our society. If you come from a village where there is people that they have not studied anything, then if you get any, thank you very much. If you get any degree, then you will be someone uh, that people will recognize. So if you study something, then you are important for your family, for your community. So that's why people study. But what, what happens when you finish your studies? But we're talking that here, you're, you do these traditional studies, okay? But what happens when you finish that and you face this work um, opportunities? You go there and they say, okay, we're looking for a young professional with 20 years of experience. 
And like, okay, <laughs> who has 20 years of experience? I have 20 years of experience maybe reading, but just that. And that's, that's something that is happening. And why that happens, I think because as young people, sometimes people don't trust on our capacities. But, and, and this happens, and I've seen this happen, and this happening, and what I see is that we can, uh, in, but in my region, and I think that, ha that can happen in other regions, we can take technology as an opportunity to be a person uh, that they can trust too. Because it's easier for us to see and to manage technology. So sometimes they, they rely on us to use technology, how to create an email, or how to open something, how to create uh, apps or things like that. They rely on us. So that is, I think, a new way to see and, and to over, uh, over, overcome this gap between, um, um, between we as, not, as a people that they do not, not trust and now to go to the people that they really trust too. So that's one, 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 one gap. And the another, the another gap that I was already, traditional work system versus a new work system. The problem with Latin America, and I think this is a problem, and we have been discussing in the, in the other um, uh, panel, that there is a lot of informal jobs, and they are not well paid. This is ma mainly labor exploitation. And if you want to work then, in, and you get a job, then, then you will not be paid well. They you will work for hours. And I'm talking about the great majority, not the ones that got privileged, and are privileged, and they got a great education. I'm talking about the, the huge mass of people that are, are there. And I think that's something that we need to, uh, we need to work a little bit more how we can solve this. And I, I, I think that we, we can have something positive here. It's um, about, um, and this is about a new way, so how we can improve this, this situation. And this is about uh, entrepreneurship. So I've, I've, I've attended the uh, fifth uh, Foro de Jóvenes de las Américas from the Cumbre de las Américas this year. It was in Lima, and I saw a lot of startups. They're using technology. They are uh, as a tool to promote their work, as a tool to be more active, be more proactive. And I think this is, this is a great way to, to build more things. So, um, okay, so I think that's, that's one thing to take technology and go farther. So that's can take questions later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vero, and apologies for speeding <laughs> you up. <laughs> um, next up, we'll have um, Ndeye Fatou. Ndeye is an engineer on engineering computer science and also technical advisor in the com computer science at the Ministry of Post and Telecommunications of MPT, right? <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. <coughs> And thank you, uh, IGF, to invite us. I'm from Senegal, ICT ministry. And uh, I am um, sorry to the absence of my director, Suleiman Jallo, who wanted to come to discuss with the young, but who had uh, last minute impeachment. And uh, it is a great uh, pleasure for us to be here to show to the uh, young how the government is working hard to give them work. And uh, if they can't have work, they can be entrepreneur and they can be employer. It's the reason we are working hard to have uh, a good environment uh, and uh, they can be uh, useful for themselves and for the country. Uh, for Senegal, we have, uh, has uh, in Africa uh, young people. You can see it in the participant, African participants, they are more young. And uh, it, uh, also they are not uh, employed, they are underemployed. And we think that the real uh, solution is uh, to be, to use digital economy. And it's what we are working uh, about uh, in Senegal. As we have uh, a strategy uh, for developing uh, the country, we focus on the digital uh, strategy. We have uh, a strategy we call the Digital Senegal 20 zero, 2025. And in this uh, <coughs> strategy, in this policy, we uh, focus on human resources. We know that uh, we have to do a good training for the uh, kids and also to give them uh, professional uh, uh, information. Also in, in this policy, we promote a digital industry 
that creates severely any work. Even uh, if we uh, have to develop uh, jobs, we have to develop industry. And we know that uh, in uh, Africa, even in Senegal, there is no more industry. And uh, the government is focusing on this to help the population uh, have uh, good work. Also, to uh, give opportunities in ICT, we have to, open, to have an open and affordable access to digital network and services. And like this, we will establish an enabling environmental to offer work to the young. Uh, in this uh, strategy, we said uh, Digital Senegal uh, 2025. Uh, we have our website. After you can, I can share you this presentation. Like this, you can use the link to know exactly what is in the uh, the office of the official. Uh, strategy or official policy to develop uh, uh, numeric in Senegal uh, has in the, the vision of the strategy is uh, digital for all, digital for all use in a good environment. And uh, to develop all this, uh, we focus on gender. We help all the uh, young girls to uh, use ICT, but to use it in a good way. As we know, uh, there is a lot of problem in using uh, not proper internet for girls, but now what we do is uh, uh, aware them to well use internet. They can be uh, employer, they can be also, uh, they can have good job because we know that E-Trade, like uh, my uh, uh, colleague said before, E-Financial is working in Senegal, but also E-Trade is working. Also, young use E-Logistics to have a job. They can uh, uh, use the ICT, the phone, uh, to pick a, a package from uh, somewhere to somewhere, and uh, they have a job like this. Uh, the uh, government plan now to more accelerate the training, uh, even on uh, we project to uh, train 3,000 people. Also, we have to give scholarships to uh, 3,000 uh, per year to uh, learn more ICT. Also, we plan to uh, uh, do good uh, digital entrepreneurships for the young. Like this, they can uh, do, create themselves more skilled jobs. And also, we have uh, incubation who helps the SMA to uh, uh, be upgraded and to be improved. Uh, the government also plan to do a financial for the uh, promotion of the digital and entrepreneurship, but also to uh, help uh, by a cut on uh, to improve the innovation of the youngs, because we, we know that there is a lot of innovation. In Senegal, when you bring a phone and it's the first, a young who hasn't to have uh, more information about ICT can repair it. And uh, now the government is focusing on them to give them, uh, uh, we have project for uh, fab labs to help them using these uh, uh, space to improve uh, what they are in uh, mind and to help them uh, uh, giving all this information. Uh, I think uh, I can wait for the uh, other question to uh, complete. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your intervention. Um, next up is Sebastian. Sebastian, can you please help me pronounce your surname? And then um, you were a social studies, um, studies, social work, yeah, at the Singapore University and also serve as a youth leader at the National Youth Council. And our question for you is, what are the lessons learned from your experience in Singapore with regards to digital literacy and skill development? You have four minutes. Thank you very much. Testing. Um, good morning. Can you hear me? Good morning, everyone. From um, I'm Sebastian from the Sunning Island of Singapore. 
and Paris is so cold for me because uh, it's a warm country in Singapore. But the people I met here are so warm in their hearts and it, that includes people like yourself. And that's also about the spirit of the internet society, meeting new people, collaborating. And so I'm just happy to be here. So I'll be sharing um, the question that was asked. So in Singapore, uh, our experience, um, one of the projects that uh, we do and one of the projects that we champion is digital inclusion, regardless of age and regardless of ability. Uh, what do I mean by that? So I'll give you an example. The National Youth Council, we work together with youth volunteers who are passionate to serve their society. Uh, we pair youth volunteers that are considered digital native together with elderly and the public who does not know or are unaware of how to use the smartphone or the internet technology safely and securely. So we also promote intergeneration bonding between youth and also the elderly. So this is uh, one of the projects that we do in Singapore. And the idea is not just to promote bonding, and the idea is not that youth are the masters of the internet. Um, it's also a dual way of learning and a double, uh, dual way of interaction between the youth and the elderly. So the elderly also have stories to share with the elderly, and this will create some um, bonding between um, both of them. Um, and, oh sorry, can you repeat the question again? The question is, what are the lessons learned from your experience in Singapore with regards to digital literacy and skill development? Okay, thank you. So what we do is uh, a set-based community development. We want to create community networks uh, because the idea, I'm not, uh, I'm not from the technical field, so, but I really appreciate uh, technical people that are in this room right now. It's important that we work together. I believe in multi-stakeholderism. That's why I'm here. Um, that's why I want to listen to you. And I'm also going to keep my speech short because I want to hear any questions that you have to any one of us and I'm more than happy to answer. Um, so what we do is we partner not just with um, the, the youth, but we also work with community organization, um, elderly homes to invite the elderly in. So this is how we let the youth have a platform to um, enhance their digital literacy skills through sharing with the elderly and the public and uh, so this is how we improve the digital literacy and also um, creating community network that uh, I think is, um, I mean, we believe in tangible uh, aspect of the internet, but we also want to create this community bond, this intangible bond. That's why you and I are here right now, and you do not just want to hear me speak, and you also probably want to ask some questions. So um, that's all for now, and please, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sebastian. Um, Thank you. Up next, we're also having another intervention from Maria Prieto. Um, Maria, our question for you now is, in two to three minute tops, um, what are your recommendations, uh, what, are the, what are the recommendations you would make for policymakers and in, um, in skills and capacity building? Okay, so there would be a two-level um, response to this because as uh, the climate and environment, um, there are no borders for the connectivity of internet. So this is something that is to be considered in this response. But at national level, the debate is go for skills development is going around the issue of responding quickly to quick changes. And one of the recommendations, or the one that is the flagship of recommendation that comes out, is the implementation, wherever possible, of a lifelong learning approach. Uh, and that would be uh, to have an inclusive approach. And I know, for example, you work from Singapore? Yes, definitely. You have it in Singapore already. There is like a development on that. There are certain other countries, such as Sweden, that have been dabbing on this. Uh, so the, the recommendation to policymakers is to, wherever possible, develop lifelong learning approaches that will equip people of all ages uh, of, with uh, capa capacities to learn how to learn in order to adapt quickly to the, the changes. No? And obviously, the issue of STEM, uh, the 
science, technology, uh, engineering, and math is uh, a, a, an, another topic that comes up often uh, in that regard. Uh, lifelong learning is a very expensive, so it has to put into context. The all countries might not be able to, to do this, but it's certainly one way of tackling the issue. Uh, at international level, <coughs> And this is maybe a way of responding to one of the questions, I think the gentleman from Senegal, that was raising the issue of the di digital divide between countries and how innovation can maybe narrow that gap. Well, at policymakers at international level, meaning international organizations, uh, the European Union, at regional level, etc., there need to be like certain regulations to protect not only the worker, but also that it is not, uh, it doesn't become like the, um, the survival of the fittest, uh, but that technology is put to use uh, and to improve the, the, the life of people in general everywhere. Because uh, we all want to achieve social justice, I hope, and I think technology has a great potential to be used that way. Uh, and that is the debates that are going on at the SDG levels, etc., that uh, that should be considered as well. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria. Um, Agus, should we take the questions now, or yes? Yes, perfect. So we're taking questions. I will. We wow. <laughs> we will do a five minute um, segment of questions. So I have one here, one, yeah, yeah. How do we sort this out? <laughs> you um, need to do short yeah. questions. <laughs> I, I'll pick like two from each side just so I'm not unfair. I know you are with your hand raised and you are with your hand raised, so you go ahead. Um, thank you. I'm Arushi Mehta from India, um, Youth at IGF Fellow. My question is that it was discussed about how um, exploitation is happening in the workplace in terms of the wages that are being given. And I think that's happening with young people a lot because I come from India. I'm a law student and I'm expected to intern every summer and winter, at least two internships. And unfortunately, all of these internships are unpaid. And I'm supposed to bear the burden of travel or, and I have to sit and I'm expected to sit there and my colleagues till 3 a.m. working. And I, I believe it is a form of exploitation that young people are just not discussing because coming from a labor intensive economy is not my fault. So I, I wish to know how I can you know, navigate through this or gain funds from somewhere or at least start a movement in which young people are paid what they deserve because we're not doing any less than the associates and possibly even more. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll take all questions in a row. So the gentleman in glass is here. Hello, um, Enoch from Nigeria, youth at IGF fellow. Um, so we've talked about the uh, digital skill acquisition or the lack of it in context of countries in Africa. And um, we seem to, s uh, where I come from in Nigeria, I am a student of the top university, University of Ibadan in Nigeria. So we are quite uh, um, updated in some of these uh, skills. Uh, for example, there's AI learning and neural networks and all that. But the problem with this is, in my country, especially where I come from, there's a mistrust for students that actually learn these skills here. For example, I work for some of the top brands that are recognizable around the world. Uh, I um, I'm, I'm part of the technical community, so I install biometric scanners and uh, network systems within buildings for the staff as they move around. But then when you try to get uh, jobs here, when you try to get uh, um, contracts, when you try to Im be involved in installation of all this, there seems to be a greater trust for expatriates than for the homegrown uh, people who actually <laughs> come from them. So even after giving um, giving them these digital skills, how do we still solve the issue of trust? Because they, they want to be sure that, uh, you know, you are not going to mess anything up. They want to be sure that you actually know these things, so they would rather just get somebody uh, from abroad, uh, others in diaspora. So I just wanted to point that out, that how can we actually help 
in alleviating these fears. So thank you. Thank you very much. You can, yeah, go ahead. Steve Zeltzer from LaborNet in San Francisco. Um, I, I think that the brother here addressed this issue of automation technology uh, marginalizing mm -hmm. people. Um, and I don't see any real plan on how to deal with it, which is future of young people. Because in the Bay Area or in California where you have a lot of young people, they are being marginalized with these platforms, Uber and other technologies. Uh, they have to, they can't survive. Uh, and um, they're temporary workers, the gig economy. There's no stability. And this is the center of technology in the world. Uh, and that's a real threat that has to be addressed uh, if we are going to have a future. And that's what I'm concerned about, a future for young people so that they can survive, have stability, have families, and take their thing, their lives forward. The other issue is privatization of education. Uh, young people can't afford to go to college because of the cost of college. They can't get the training in the United States. Uh, so this is another major issue that young people face that, that needs to be addressed. Uh, you can't even get an education. How are you going to get skills to take you forward in your work? So those are some of these issues that I think has to be confronted in future of uh, work and technology in the new economy. Thank you very much. We have one last question. I see you, Juliana, with your hand raised. Please be brief. Thank you. Uh, my friend from Haiti would like to have his question uh, asked in French. Bonjour. Je suis Junior. Je viens d'Haïti. Je voulais poser ma question en français. Tout à l'heure, je voulais demander, est-ce qu'on... En fait, la plupart des sites qui donnent des, des jobs, des, des, des travaux online, exigent d'abord qu'on paie pour le service. OK, comment peut-on créer une un espace plus sûr avec moins de risques parce que en Haïti surtout on n'a pas suffisamment d'argent on ne veut pas qu'on nous nous vole nous enlève notre argent merci so um, does anyone in, in the table speak French because I can translate it if it's all right so what he asked is uh, regarding platforms that offer uh, freelance jobs and temporary jobs, most of those platforms, they, uh, they require uh, prepaid, uh, they require that the users pay for, for using the platform. And some of the workers in, in his country, Haiti, cannot afford to, to be part of, the, of this community, of this prepaid, uh, this freelance uh, platforms and, and online community for job offers. So he would like to know uh, what can be a solution for, for this kind of problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Would any of the panelists would like to address any of the questions? Would you guys would like to answer any of the questions? Vero, Sebastian, and then you? Sir? Go ahead, Sebastian. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, much better. Um, I mean, Okay, maybe I'll answer the, the lady question on the um, from India, right? Um, regarding exploitation. So I think um, okay, it's not exactly like fake news, but um, you have to be aware of where is the source of the information of uh, your job advertisement. And perhaps uh, most organization, because of course, they would they might um, purposely, unintentionally, or intentionally try to mislead, uh, especially young people like ourselves, which is much more... But they're actually pretty big, like I'm talking about the biggest law firms in the okay. country, yeah. So yeah. it's not a question of um, credibility, okay. but more of um, the fact that why are we not getting paid. Can you repeat again? Um, it's not a question of credibility, but like why are we not getting paid to do twice okay. the work of employees? Well, well I definitely agree with you, and I think that is a great question. Um, but I'm not an employer, but I can share with you based on my. No, no, no. Just um, but I can share with you based on my youth perspective, and also based on my experience uh, searching for a job. Um, on I think on the other 
hand, the employers, I'm sure some, we have some employers here in, whether it's in the panel or sitting down here with us, uh, they who say that um, young people are lazy. We are the strawberry generation. We are not working hard enough. So that is their way for us to train and to prove ourselves. So, but to solve your question, how can we do it? Um, you either search for a job that, um, that satisfy you with that criteria or you find a way to negotiate it. And I think different culture, uh, different country and different culture have different ways of doing things. Uh, I'm not very sure about India. I've never been to India, so I'm sorry that I can't answer that. But uh, in Singapore, uh, at least that, um, I, think, I think in US, uh, social advocacy is one of the things that um, they are very open and very liberal, so they can champion it. But in Singapore, um, I think the government control uh, is much more top-down approach. So I'm not sure about India. Um, so you need to understand uh, how can you actually advocate your issues to the relevant um, organization. Perhaps is there a labor union or organization in that so they can address and perhaps you can even work together with like-minded youth like yourself that has such issues so that you're not alone and you can work together. Uh, I hope I answer your question. Thank you very much. I want to answer to the French question. Uh, I, I can speak in French and after I can traduce it in English. Uh, merci pour votre question. À propos des plateformes que vous disiez payantes, uh, peut-être ça dépend des pays. Parce que nous au Sénégal, nous avons des plateformes que nous mettons en place pour les jeunes, uh, pour le ministère de la jeunesse qui le met. Il uh, y a des plateformes comme Emploi SN pour le Sénégal. SN. Et nous avons aussi d'autres, euh, comme on appelle, scènejob.com, où les jeunes peuvent aller déposer leur CV, voir s'il y a des offres de stage, s'il y a des offres euh, d'emploi qu'ils peuvent utiliser. Donc, ça dépend des pays. Ça dépend aussi de la créativité des jeunes. Comme disait l'autre, euh, <coughs> l'avantage du numérique, c'est qu'on peut être, euh, au lieu d'être employé, on peut être employeur parce qu'on a la possibilité d'utiliser euh, le smartphone, le téléphone ou bien euh, le PC pour chercher du travail ou bien pour offrir du travail. Il faut quand même seulement utiliser l'innovation, utiliser la créativité, mais surtout euh, ne pas trop utiliser les réseaux sociaux pour faire autre chose que du travail. Uh, I wanted to tell him that uh, it depends on uh, some countries where uh, uh, we can find some uh, uh, platform who are not, uh, who are some platforms who are free. In Senegal, we have two platforms for the youngs, uh, joined by the Ministry of uh, Young Ministry, uh, where they can go to uh, put their uh, uh, information and they can find some jobs. But also, I wanted to tell him that it is not in uh, uh, ICT necessary to be employer. You have to be uh, the one who give jobs to others. Uh, you have to use your innovation. You have to use your uh, uh, experiences also to use ICT and uh, use uh, e-finance, e-trading, e-learning. Uh, and you can be uh, uh, not to, to wait to have a job, but you can give jobs also. Thank okay. you. Thank you very much. We are supposed to finish the session right now, or in fact, a minute ago. We will take four minutes more. The next session is uh, 11.50, and it's about the future of jobs too. So I encourage you all to stay. Uh, Adela, who is there, will be moderating. We will do this. Uh, Maria will tackle some of the questions in two minutes. Um, Pablo Hinojosa from APNIC, who is another honorary youth fellow, <laughs> uh, will do the closing. Uh, so two minutes here, two minutes here, and I encourage you to stay to the next session where, where I think we will continue addressing these questions. Thank you very much, and sorry about the time. Concerning the issue of internships, uh, there is an ongoing uh, negotiation for the development of guidelines for interns. That is a very difficult discussion uh, for many reasons. Uh, the ILO recommends paid internships, which is what we implement in our organization. Uh, I would recommend 
that you have a look at those guidelines and you sort of slip them to your, to your employer as, as, as um, maybe some guidelines to, to follow if possible. Yeah? Uh, there are no established, that I know of, international guidelines on that issue. Uh, and the issue of uh, 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 and the gentleman here in front of me, um, the privatization of the education in the U.S. It's mainly the U.S., which is, uh, yeah, Europe, not so much, uh, because it's another system. Um, but it is true that it is becoming more expensive. There are, like, the elite have access to schools, and this is something that might not be uh, the best way to to, uh, to develop in that in that area. Um, and that actually does marginalize certain people on the way they develop uh, skills, etc. cetera. Um, but the issue of how technologies are, do you mentioned Uber, you mentioned temporary workers, and that trend of non-standard forms of employment. Uh, we recently came out with a publication in the ILO on, the, on that issue. Uh, that gives you the, the trends and the data and some of the recommendations that the organization uh, gives for, for those types of non-standard forms of employment. Education is unfortunately not in our, it is in this house, but not in my house. So this is something that UNESCO should uh, be addressing. Uh, pour le monsieur uh, de IT, uh, Moi, j'aurais dit que jamais j'aurais payé pour uh, mettre mon CV dans l'Internet. Donc, uh, parce que normalement, ça ne se fait pas. Parce qu'on ne sait, uh, uh, sait jamais si uh, ça peut se passer. Mais la recommandation, c'est que uh, uh, normalement, uh, on ne sait pas, pas payant uh, les, les sites uh, pour uh, avoir du travail. Je ne sais pas comment c'est chez, chez vous, uh, mais normalement, ça se passe. Okay. Thank you very much, Pablo. I give you the closing word. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. What an honor. Actually, um, I was just thinking who's doing the report, because that is going to be a very difficult task. Uh, there has been a lot uh, that has been said here today, including Ellison's video. Don't forget to put something in the report, because that's a very nice place where he lives. And um, many different conversations around platforms, future of jobs, uh, and uh, all things that we know today and things that we don't know. Uh, I heard a lot about challenges and difficulties uh, together with initiatives, but I didn't get a lot of a sense of opportunity, and I would like to bring that to the uh, closing um, uh, moment. Uh, I, I was thinking about the speeches yesterday, and I don't know if you were at the room. If you were not at the room, you need to follow them on, on, on YouTube. The Secretary General of the UN and the President of France uh, gave uh, very, very important speeches. And if we think deeply about them in the context of future jobs, uh, I can just think of about a few thousand, <laughs> a few tens of thousands maybe of full-time jobs that will be required worldwide if their vision expressed yesterday will ever be translated into action and how deeply challenging these jobs will be uh, in terms of figuring out, for example, mechanisms to bring a multidisciplinary approach to a multi-stakeholder um, uh, setting. And, and, and it's not about job vacancies at the UN. No, oh, no, please, no, you know. <laughs> it is about uh, all different sorts of, of, of ways of thinking. And, and just to think, for example, architects to design proper rooms uh, for these discussions to occur in a conducive manner. This room is obsolete, it is uncomfortable, and, and, and it is no longer suitable for these kinds of discussions. Where are the architects designing the rooms for these discussions to happen, right? These are unresolved questions, and I think uh, only Jude is suitable and capable to provide those answers. I will leave it there. Thank you very much, everyone. We close here, and we continue the discussion in the next session on Future of Job 2. Thank you very much.